The next 15 seconds could save someone's life. There's a deadly drug claiming lives of Arizona youth at an alarming rate. The drug, counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl. They're cheap, easy to get, and only one pill can kill. Learn more at talknowaz.com. Evening and good morning to everyone. I'm saying good morning because we have someone that has joined us from halfway around the world. And uh, we would like to acknowledge her. So thank you for joining us today. This is a webinar, one of our, part of our monthly webinar series. We have today with us Mr. Joe Uhas, which Mr. Grizar will provide a brief introduction. However, I just want to give you a little bit of background information of the HEAL Coalition which stands for Help Enrich African American Lives. We've been in existence for almost roughly 15 years. We have to determine that, the exact date, so we can celebrate. However, what we primarily tackle and look at uh, substance use disorder within the African American county within Phoenix and Maricopa County. We are also a sister coalition member of several coalitions throughout the state and different organizations that tackle substance abuse in some form or fashion. However, most recently, we have been looking at vaping, an area which was pretty new for us. However, we were very fortunate to run into somebody that approached us at the right time and has that information that's going to share with us this evening about vaping. So with that little brief background about HEAL and the purpose of this occasion, I will turn it over to Mr. Lauren Grizzard, our well, I, leader. Mr. Miller, can you tell a little bit about our, our parent organization, TCDC? Okay. Ooh. Our parent organization is Tanner Community Development Corporation, TCDC for short. And we primarily look at the resources available for the African-American community within Maricopa counties. However, we do have some ties and some extensions throughout the state and even national. And we have worked on various projects. We have several different, I guess you can say divisions or departments within our organization within Tanner, uh, some of which are the bath project and some of them also provide utility assistance to the population, whoever comes in and applies. So if that's good enough, anything else, Lauren? Anybody oh, else? That's good. Okay. With that being said, I will turn it over to Mr. Grizzard. All right. Good evening, everyone. As Mr. Miller stated that this is a, a one uh, in a series of webinars that the Hill Coalition has um, been uh, producing pretty much since COVID hit. We used to be out in the community doing face-to-face -face trainings. Of course, when uh, we were faced with the challenge of the pandemic, we had to uh, shift gears and figure out a way to still be able to share information with the community at large. And we went to a <laughs> webinar series, which a lot of other organizations have. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been on several webinars throughout the past few months. But we thank you for taking time out for this one. Uh, dealing with vaping. Uh, one of the um, uh, projects of the Hill Coalition is to address substance misuse prevention for teens. Uh, being, uh, we look at alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, and tobacco. And of course, one of the delivery methods for marijuana and tobacco and other substances is vaping. And so that is something that we wanted to delve into and uh, share with the community last year. Uh, we were approached by our uh, presenter this evening, Mr. Joe Uhas. Uh He is with 1025 Public Affairs. And with that, uh, where he is the principal. And then uh, with that, he is a manager for Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And uh, he uh, approached us to uh, aid him and, and collaborate with him in the work that he was doing to uh, place a ban on flavored vaping products, uh, which were uh, aimed at various um, 
um, demographics of the community that that we serve. But I'll let him share that a little bit more. But uh, we have uh, worked side by side with him on this campaign, and uh, uh, we are uh, appreciative of the work that 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 he does, and felt that he would be the proper candidate to uh, share something with us on vaping and its effects on our youth and other um, policy issues. So without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to Mr. Joseph Yuhas. Thank you, Lauren, and, and good evening, everyone. And, and what a delight it is for me to be here. Um, Lauren is correct. It was two years ago now almost that uh, prior to, just prior to the pandemic, um, that uh, I approached, I, I learned of HEAL, wasn't, I, I, you know, I certainly know the Tanner uh, Community Development Corporation, but I was unaware of HEAL. And it was one of the first organizations that took me in uh, when I brought to, to the attention of the organization, you know, what the campaign uh, for tobacco-free kids was attempting to do here in Phoenix and here in Arizona. So as Lauren mentioned, I, I have a public affairs practice and uh, I work for myself. I get to pick and choose the projects that I want to engage in. And more often than not, people find me as opposed to me finding them. And I just had the good fortune for um, folks uh, from the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which is based in Washington, D.C., to approach me and talk about what they want to do here in Arizona and would I be willing to join their cause. And so I embraced the idea for a variety of reasons. But as I got deeper into it, I realized you know, how really critical this issue is. Um, to really save the next generation of uh, from a lifetime of nicotine addiction. So, um, you know, you can't talk about vaping unless you talk about tobacco. You can't talk about vaping and tobacco unless you talk about flavors. They're all three, uh, as I've learned, um, interrelated. So I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'd, I'd like to go through, Lauren. So if you could, uh, you know, uh, give me the ability to uh, screen share uh, my Wait a minute here. I got to do this first. Um, I'd love to be able to have the opportunity to share this as soon as I can hook it up. And then I'm going to step us through this. Okay, so can you all see that? Okay, terrific. So, as I said, you can't talk about these issues on their own unless you talk about them uh, in a in a sort of a unified fashion. Now, although some people, uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, the statistics around tobacco use, I think it's always helpful to sort of reframe the public health problem of tobacco use in the entire nation and compare it then to. Uh, local communities, and you're going to have an opportunity. We're going to have an opportunity to do that. So, although overall smoking rates have been declining over the past decade or so in the U.S., we continue to see a high number of uh, tobacco use, particularly among youth. Um, and really, uh, newer products like e-cigarettes have started to replace the, the traditional combustible cigarettes. You know, the cigarettes that we've grown accustomed to have been around us our whole lives, um, and those are being now um, supplemented with new products, new nicotine products that are really becoming the choice of youth and young people. Now, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you'll see that 11.3% of high school students report using e-cigarettes compared to uh, smoking rates, which are uh, national, you know, smoking rates, which are around 4.6%. So this has now become sort of the preferred uh, nicotine product of choice. Uh, kids are using this by, uh, you know, two to three times more uh, than uh, combustible cigarettes. Um, and current tobacco use, which includes smoking, vaping, and other use of tobacco products among high school students is pretty high now. It's, it's almost a quarter of that population, over 23%. Now, this is a problem because we know from decades of research that tobacco is linked to preventable death and disease in the U.S. Each year, over 480,000 will die due to smoking and the exposure to secondhand smoke. And to give you you know, some sense of what that means. If you took three fully loaded 747s and they crashed every day, 365 days a year, three 
747s, and no one survived. That's what would equal 480,000 people a year. You know, when you think about the, the kinds of health challenges that we face, whether it's heart disease or cancer uh, uh, or lung disease, you know, those, you know, sometimes those diseases really aren't avoidable. But boy, you can certainly avoid the 480,000 deaths by simply making the voluntary decision not to use tobacco in e-cigarette products. Now, the toll of tobacco in Arizona. Um, when you look at the smoking and tobacco use rates in the U.S. and compare it to Arizona, you'll see that the smoking rates among high schoolers is higher than the national average. Again, the national average is 4.6%. Uh, but now we see here uh, in, uh, uh, among Arizona high school students, 17.9%. Um, you know, the, the rate the rate of students who are using e-cigarettes. And that number is growing, growing every year. Now, you, you, you also might note, again, if you look back at that previous slide, adult cigarette smoking rate is slightly lower than national average. So you might say, well, that's good, right? Well, it is good. But that further highlights that if we have a higher smoking rate than the national average as a whole in Arizona, and our adult rate is going down, the only way it could be going up among our entire populations because more and more kids are using tobacco and e-cigarette products. Now, so again, the toll on, uh, on, on our state, 8,300 adults die each year from their own smoking uh, habits uh, over their lifetime. Kids that are now under 18 uh, and who are currently alive but are using uh, tobacco products will die a premature death in Arizona that's a number of 115,000, 115,000 18 year olds, current 18 year olds in Arizona will die a premature death because they are currently using tobacco products. Now there's a monetary cost, obviously, um, uh, beyond, uh, you know, these premature deaths, not only to those that are using tobacco, but frankly, to all of us, because it increases our healthcare costs by $2.38 billion. Medicaid costs in Arizona, which are picked up by the taxpayers, $382 million is spent each year dealing with the effects of tobacco and e-cigarette use through the various Medicaid programs. That's a burden of $715 on each and every one of our households. So the evolution of e-cigarettes, you know, we've seen uh, these products kind of come and go and over the past several years, and you'll see this in a slide that's coming up, you know, how the companies that have gotten involved in this have come and gone. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the, uh, the three uh, principal uh, uh, tobacco companies, uh, R.J. Reynolds, uh, Philip Morris, Lorillard, you know, they were manufacturing and selling basically combustible cigarettes and cigars and other tobacco products. But what we've seen over these years is that there's been a huge transition as these companies have gotten more and more involved in other products, other nicotine-based products, because every time some action is taken over here to limit a product, cut down, you know, eliminate the advertising of tobacco, for example, these companies have found new and better ways uh, from their vantage point to introduce new products with, again, uh, nicotine as its base. So, for example, Altria started out as Phil the Philip Morris Company. It changed its name in 2003. It acquired the U.S. smokeless tobacco company. So now they got involved in the chewing tobacco sector. Um, they eventually became involved with a 35% stake in Juul. Juul is the largest manufacturer of disposable e-cigarette products. And that holds true for, again, these other major companies that have found ways to uh, 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 you know, enter the e-cigarette market. So when you hear Big Tobacco talk about these products are helpful because it helps keep people, uh, it weans them away from uh, tobacco use, which is worse. You know, we're, tobacco, worse is, tobacco smoke is much worse. It has carcinogens in it. There's a secondhand smoke. You know, they'll, they'll preach as, as, as if this is like some kind of miracle alternative to combustible tobacco. When the fact of the matter is they know these are also nicotine-based products and that one way or the other, these products are going to hook people, especially kids, again, and place them on a, the pathway of a lifetime of 
of nicotine uh, addiction. So that's exactly what's happened. These flavored products are putting a new generation of kids at risk because really a lot of what's driving tobacco use in the U.S. and in Arizona and in other states is flavored tobacco and flavored e-cigarettes. These products, which come in a wide variety, and they're clearly designed to appeal to youth and young adults. So there's been an explosion of flavored tobacco, tobacco products these last several years. I, I still can't get my head around this, but when I was first asked to join the campaign for tobacco-free kids and I went through my orientation, they informed me that there are over 15,000 unique e-cigarette flavored products. Now, I couldn't understand, I mean, I couldn't think of 15,000 flavors of anything. How could there possibly be this many uh, flavors? Well, as they told me, Joe, you need to understand, there's, are, there's banana, and then there's strawberry, then there's also strawberry banana. So these flavors get combined. And, and, and again, what we've seen here is despite the FDA's ban on flavored cigarettes, and that's very important to remember, and that's why I said you, you can't talk about e-cigarettes without talking about tobacco. Years ago, the FDA said you cannot uh, sell flavored cigarette products. The only exception was menthol. They made an exception for menthol, and that's exactly what the industry wanted. But yet, these same nicotine-based products through the form of e-cigarettes can be sold in the very fl same flavors that are banned for combustible tobacco. And again, the, the industry knew, uh, because this is continuing a long-time tradition of designing products that appeal explicitly to new and younger users. So the tobacco companies in recent years have significantly stepped up their introduction and marketing of flavored tobacco products, particularly e-cigarettes and cigars. And I'm gonna to get to cigars in a minute. And that's particularly important because uh, you're gonna see how they, they, they really does zero in on the African-American community. So again, while the overall cigarette sales has been declining, the overall cigarette, sales rate has been declining over the last several years. The proportion of smokers using menthol cigarettes, which is the lone remaining flavored product among traditional combustible tobaccos, that has continued to rise. So these flavored tobacco products are really popular among kids. It's, it's this growing market, it's, it's really no coincidence because the tobacco industry knows that flavored tobacco products appeal primarily to youth and new smokers. In fact, according uh, to a, a 2021 National Youth Tobacco Survey, eight out of 10 kids who have used tobacco products start with a flavored product. 81%. They start with a flavored tobacco product. And these aren't just, you know, casual users. You know, you hear, you know, we, we've often heard over the years, you know, oh, I smoke, but I'm just a social smoker. You know, I'll smoke every once in a while when I have you know, a drink or with, I'm, I'm with friends, but th that's not the case with these products again, because and I was going to tell you in a few minutes, their concentration of nicotine is so high. 71% uh, of these youth say that they have used a flavored tobacco product sometime in the past month. Now that doesn't mean they use it 12 times a year. No, it means they're regular users. Okay, so the most recent National Youth Tobacco Survey also found that e-cigarettes were the most commonly used tobacco product among middle and high school students. Now, I'm, I'm finding more and more, you know, we, you know, the perception is this is a high school thing. This is, you know, this is where you really see the problem. No, it's trickling down more and more now to the middle school and even the elementary school level. Because flavors play a major role in the youth use of these e-cigarettes because they mask the taste of the tobacco. They mask the harshness of tobacco uh, and make it easier for new users to initiate use. Now, in addition, many youth perceive the flavored tobacco products to be less harmful. They, again, there's this perception out there that, well, this isn't as bad as, as smoking. It's not as bad as using tobacco. But the fact of the matter is uh, that that is not true uh, because the findings are supported by most recently the Surgeon General and e-cigarettes said, which he concluded, that flavors are among the most commonly cited reasons for using e-cigarettes among youth. And again, 88% of youth uh, who use e-cigarettes favor, or, you know, 80% of those uh, youths who use uh, e-cigarette products, they prefer those flavored products. So 
So when I tell you about the concentration of nicotine, and I mentioned earlier, Juul, Juul is just one of the many companies that, that manufacture these products. In a single, single Juul pod, it contains as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes, 20 cigarettes. The amount of nicotine in 20 cigarettes is found in just one of these e-cigarette cartridges. Now, these, these are a growing threat to our kids because disposable cigarettes, they look cool. They look fun. They're small. You can hide them in your hand. Um, I've, got, I've seen products now. Uh, there's a one of the pro there's several actually there's a there's a uh, backpack in which there's a hose that's connected to the backpack and you can hide your e-cigarette in your backpack and the hose comes out and that's how you can vape but probably one of the more outrageous products i've seen there's a hoodie and in the pocket of the hoodie you can hide your cartridge and through the drawstring of the hoodie you can you can vape because it's hooked up to your your cartridge in the in the you know in that's in the pocket of the hoodie um and that's in cases where, you know, you got to hide it in school or whatever. But the truth of the matter is these things are viewed by kids as, you know, popular and easy to use. And like I said, you can hide it in the, in the palm of your hand. Now, from February 20 to December 2021, sales of these disposable products increased by 173%. So it went from 2.8 million users to 7.6 million. And during that period, the market share of disposable devices increased from 18% to 35%. So it used to be where when e-cigarettes first came out, there was a like a permanent kind of thing. It looked like almost like the size of a little cell phone. And you just kept filling it with the juice, as it was called. Well, now these products are disposable and they're becoming um, you know, more and more prevalent. And it's the product of choice among kids who vape. Um, this is probably true for other school districts in the state. But I can tell you the Paradise Valley School District in North Phoenix has a plumbing contractor who is on contract for the sole purpose of going to each of the high schools once a week and going into the restrooms and fishing out these disposable cartridges from the toilets in the girls and boys room. It's like, it's, it's like a multi, you know, $200,000 a year contract because that's how prevalent these products are uh, in, in our high schools. So this is a, you know, this is frankly, you know, not rocket science. This is a playbook taken out of the past. This is how the tobacco industry itself introduced its flavored products to begin with, menthol cigarettes being the, the best example. First, they lure kids with these flavors, flavors that mask, again, the harshness of the product. Um, that's what ultimately initially attracts the kids. They like the flavor of it. But what hooks them, again, is these massive doses of nicotine. And then they also make it cool. They make it cool on social media. They sponsor activities. They have very smart, wise advertising. You know, again, these are all designed to be attractive to kids. And then in more recent years, they've hooked up with big tobacco. So again, you see how tobacco giant Altria, again, and they make, they're the ones who make Marlboro cigarettes. They become a 35% equity partner in, 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 in Juul. So the companies, again, that are distributing these tobacco products, to our convenience stores and to our retail shops, the same companies that are now delivering uh, these e-cigarette products. So what we're doing now is we're, we're you know, we tobacco campaign for tobacco free okay, kids. So, um, again, it's not surprising. We find growing popularity um, because just like uh, e-cigarettes, cigar, co cigar companies are using the same marketing strategies. So you were talking just before I got back on the line. Hey, I heard it. I remember about these cigars. Well, you know, the flavors that are banned in cigarettes, they don't apply to cigars. And that is one of the reasons why we're seeing explosive growth in the sale of flavored cigars, especially as you're going to hear in a few minutes within the African-American community. So, you know, th these stories are legendary all over the country. Why kids get involved with this to begin with. Um, they like the flashy flavors. Uh, you know, it seems like the cool thing to do. Um, they like the flavor, of course, but uh, once they realize they're kind of hooked on this thing, they need it, you know, more and more frequently. It's because, again, they're now hooked on the nicotine. So these cigars, they come in 250 different flavors. And of course, that number is growing. So there you are. Lauren, you just mentioned Swishers. There they are, the third, fourth one over, right? Some of these, and they're very affordable. Some of them are often two for 99 cents, and they come in, again, an array of flavors. 
And so while there's been an explosive growth in the flavor options for cigars, such as candy, fruit, chocolate, and various other kid-friendly uh, flavors, that also has you know, sort of fed, again, the growth of this sector of the tobacco um, market. So it's not surprising that cigars are just as popular as cigarettes among high school students. Why? Because again, those cigars come in the kind of flavors that have been banned by the FDA um, uh, to, to, uh, the, the, uh, as far as cigarettes are concerned. Again, the only flavored cigarette product that remains on the market this day is menthol. All other flavors have been banned, but it doesn't mean that those flavors can't be applied to um, applied to cigarettes. You know, it's interesting that there's a higher percentage of girls that prefer the cigars. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that because you always think cigar is like sort of the ultimate male thing, right? Yeah. Look, yeah. Look, look at that. <laughs> look at that, right? But again, wow. it's about the it's about the flavors. They can't get these cigarettes in those kinds of flavors. So what are they going to do? They're going to buy the cigars. Now, here's what's really outrageous. Um, this is a combination of uh, flavors, but also the marketing activities. Uh, Big Tobacco has a long history of targeting communities of color, especially the African-American community. So when you see, um, you know, again, the kind of, uh, you know, disparity in terms of the use of, of, of cigar products, it's particularly pronounced in the African-American and the Hispanic communities. And I have another, I have another, maybe I can share this with you later, but we did a study in Phoenix uh, where we did a pin map of where all the tobacco retailers are. And you'll see the concentration of those shops, um, particularly in South and West Phoenix. So again, there's a long history of menthol products uh, targeting the African-American community. Uh, it was back in 2009 that the FDA banned, again, those flavored cigarettes, but they made the exception for menthol cigarettes. Menthol have, uh, cigarettes have a profound impact on public health, particularly obstructive impact on the African-American and Latino community. In 2013, the FDA released a report that said menthol cigarettes led to increased smoking uh, initiation among youth and young adults, greater addiction and a decreased success in quitting smoking. So again, menthol masks that harshness of the product. But it was African-Americans who suffer the greatest burden of tobacco-related mortality of any racial ethnic group in the United States. The approximately 45,000 African-Americans dying from smoking-related diseases each year. Half of youth who ever started smoking started with a menthol cigarette. And menthol is uh, preferred the preferred tobacco product by many of the vulnerable populations. And again, there's a history of targeting with advertising. You know, uh, I grew, I'm from New Jersey originally. I, I grew up in a, a, a racially diverse, uh, rich, culturally rich community, Trenton, New Jersey. And it was funny how I would see in, in, uh, in, in, in certain neighborhoods, these kind of like miniature billboards. You know, you didn't see them everywhere else, but you would see them uh, in predominantly African-American and Latino communities, and they would inevitably have um, a tobacco product advertisement on it. And it was a cheap, affordable way for the industry to advertise in those communities because it wasn't a full-size billboard. Um, but it was something that always struck me, even when I was growing up. And this project has really highlighted, you know, how that kind of strategy has worked for the industry over the years. And, you know, it from... Even, uh, you know, some of the magazines um, and advertise, you know, full page advertisements that, are, that were over the years in publications targeting the African-American community. Those ads, of course, are now banned. So there are things happening uh, on the federal front. Uh, just three weeks ago, the FDA, after 10 years of debate, and I shared this with Lauren and the, and the Heal team on uh, was it Monday? I think it was Monday or Tuesday. Lauren and in, in our discussion, um, the FDA has finally, after a decade of debate, deliberation, and research, has recommended the removal of menthol cigarettes in the marketplace. Now, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, they're going to go through their comment period, and the industry, of course, is going to fight it. And then there's going to be court litigation. You know, it probably won't happen for another five years. 
And I don't want to sound pessimistic about it. I just want to be realistic because it puts even that much more importance on what we can do locally. So there are some opportunities for action. One is to support, obviously, the, the Food and Drug Administration's recent uh, proposal um, that rejects all flavored uh, e-cigarette uh, applications, including menthol as well as, uh, again, that menthol ban of uh, combustible tobacco products. There's uh, action pending in Congress to support the FDA's actions to prohibit flavored tobacco products and to support additional funding for tobacco prevention and cessation programs, which have relative, been relatively flat the last several years. The industry has worked hard to make that happen. They want people to buy their products, so they certainly aren't going to be in Congress recommending great, uh, more funding for tobacco prevention and cessation programs. Um, but what we're starting to see more and more is that states and, and local municipalities are starting to take their own action, most notably through the passage of legislation to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. And, and there is a very uh, vibrant effort underway here in Arizona to do just that, and I'm privileged to be a part of it. Can I ask so five, you sure, sure, Merle. Or do you want me to wait for the end? You, you know, you could do either or. Why, why don't you let me proceed? And, uh, oh, and, then, uh, oh. I'll, and then I could go back to these other slides too, if I have to, but I, I, chances are I might answer your question while I move ahead. So that's fine. So five, state, five states have, uh, have restricted the sale of flavored tobacco products, uh, including my home state of New Jersey. I got to tell you, it was just, just a coincidence, but my, I was served in a legislature in New Jersey. And my running mate, Shirley Turner, was the, ends up being the spot. Now she moves on to the Senate. She, she's in the state Senate. She's been in the state Senate for 20 years. She was the sponsor of the New Jersey bill to prohibit flavored tobacco products. So here we are 20 years apart. We remain good friends, but we're kind of both involved in the same fight on opposite ends of the country. But also what's happened is over 330 cities have enacted restrictions on the sale of flavored tobacco products. Uh, now, no city in Arizona has, but we're going to make that, uh, uh, we're going to change that beginning tomorrow. We've got uh, efforts underway in Colorado, for example, to join California in a statewide ban. Uh, the city of Portland in Maine, Detroit in Michigan, New York City is working towards a menthol ordinance. They, New York City already bans flavored e-cigarette products, but they're going to expand that ordinance to include menthol. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, Washington, and the county, uh, the, ma the two major counties in Oregon. Um, these are just current fights that are going on. In addition to those 355 cities and, and towns and five states that have enacted flavors ordinances. Now, tomorrow, uh, and it's just kind of coincidental that, that Lauren asked me to do this tonight, um, we are going before the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and our coalition is, is appearing before a committee of the Tempe City Council to begin the process of enacting an ordinance to end the sale of flavored tobacco and e-cigarette products in the city of Tempe. Now, if that is to happen, that will be the first city in Arizona to join those 355 other cities. We believe that's going to be the kickstart of a statewide movement. Um, I, in fact, I've already uh, uh, been contacted by a number of mayors and council members in other communities they want this to come to their community too. So we got a lot riding on our success in Tempe between now and next month when the ordinance comes before the full council. Now, as Lauren and many of you know, uh, we did uh, in initiate an effort here in the city of Phoenix, and I live in the city of Phoenix. In fact, I, I'm, I'm within walking distance of the Heal office. That's how close I am to your building that doesn't have air conditioning. So you, I may have lost my internet, but at least I have air conditioning. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm disappointed now what happened, but but I'll tell you but I'll tell you what what really really what happened. Um, Tobacco free kids initially came to Phoenix because it's the largest city in the state. We're going to get this ordinance, this flavors ordinance, passed in the largest city of the state. It has the probably one of the large. It's you know because it's the largest, it has the largest Latino population. It has the largest African American population. This is where it has to happen first. But, uh, you know, the pandemic set in and that made it difficult for us to get in front of policymakers in City Hall. Um, frankly, some of the members of the city council uh, uh, kind of leaned towards the tobacco retailers in their district. 
And so while we haven't given up in Phoenix, we put a pause on it for now uh, with the hope that the, you know, cooler heads will prevail and they'll come around eventually when they see other communities like Tempe pass their own flavors ordinances. So we haven't given up on the largest city in the state. It's still very much on our list of cities we want to um, enact this ordinance in, but we're confident we're going to do it in other communities first and uh, eventually Phoenix will come back around. And in, uh, the, the, now, while, while we have, as I said, put a pause on it in Phoenix, what it did give us the opportunity to do is to build this massive coalition of over 50 organizations in the public health, education, social justice, youth service, um, hospital and healthcare communities. Uh, and this is just some of the s- supporters of the uh, Flavors Hook Kids effort. Um, we had 6,000 uh, uh, signers of a petition in the city of Phoenix. Um, school districts in particular really embrace this. I told you about this the situation at Paradise Valley School District, for example. They know it's a problem. Right. So now what we've done is we've, take this co- we've taken this coalition, we've pivoted them to Tempe. And eventually we're going to use them in Goodyear and Flagstaff and all these, because many of these groups are statewide. And so... Uh, while, you know, again, to some degree, we're, we were disappointed that Phoenix hasn't acted. It did give us the opportunity to build this coalition that we're now pivoting and using in other communities. So what's next? Uh, tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon, we appear before the Human Services and Public Safety Committee uh, of the Tempe City Council. Our hope is that they're going to recommend that, that flavors ordinance to the full council. That ordinance will come before the full council sometime in late June, we believe probably on June 23rd. Now, once that happens, we're going to then seek uh, the enactment of flavors ordinances in other cities. As I said, some of those mayors have contacted us already. We're already starting to lay the groundwork in some of those other communities. We also simultaneously have to, we've been doing this now for a couple of years, oppose Big Tobacco's uh, efforts to secure passage of state legislation that really is is in their favor. In fact, they write, they write the bills. They wrote the bills and they handed it to legislators and said, this is what we want you to want you to sponsor. And those bills include provisions that would create what's known as preemption. Uh, it's interesting that the Arizona legislature doesn't, they often will say, we don't want Washington to tell us what to do, but they're not reluctant to tell cities and towns what to do. And in this case, what they're seeking to do is to preempt cities and towns from enacting their own local tobacco regulations. They know that we're going to go about this town by town because we can't get it done at the Capitol. So what are they trying to do? Well, actually, Big Tobacco is trying to do, they're just doing the bidding for Big Tobacco is to try to basically cut off our legs and prevent us from doing this in Tempe and all these other communities. But so far, we've been holding that legislation in check. We've got obviously a lot of legislators that are on our side. Uh, We just have to get through this session and make sure that preemption bill doesn't pass. As outrageous as that is, what I find even more outrageous are provisions in that bill. Again, this is a bill that's written by Big Tobacco that doesn't penalize the retailers for selling the kids. It penalizes kids. Kids are the, the targets here. The kids are the victims. You know, when, when, when a child is hooked on nicotine, they're going to buy that product. They're going to get their hands on that product some way, one way or the other. Well, what, what, the, what the state, leg, the bill in the legislature that's pending does, it basically criminalizes kids under the age of 21 who use e-cigarettes or tobacco products. So that means that, you know, they can't get a job because now they got a criminal record. They can't get a going to college because they got a criminal record. And I don't need to tell many of you on this call, you know, when you have an encounter between a young person and a law enforcement officer, sometimes those situations can spin out of control real quick. So this is what the legislature, this is their answer to the problem. Put the onus on the kids, not on the retailers that are hooking these kids, especially hooking them with these flavors. And then, of course, what else What else is next is uh, the final action by the FDA on the menthol products. As I said, it might be three to five years off, which is why these local efforts are so important, because every year that we wait to make, make some kind of meaningful reform here, you know, tens of thousands of kids get hooked on nicotine products and they're using these products for the balance of their lifetime as short as it might be because of these products. So now I will take any of your questions. And if you need me to refer back to any of the slides, I can, I can certainly do that. Joseph. Um, um, So I'm going to take it off though for now. Joseph, I obviously not a teenager, 
Um, I was a smoker since I was 13 years old because my parents smoked and that was the way it was, you know, Um, once, and I smoked all through my adult life. And uh, then later, much, you know, fast forward, I went to vaping. Yeah. And, and I don't want any cigarettes anymore because I taste that carcinogen. And But I will tell you all, I had to quit vaping. I had a massive heart attack last year. Yeah. And uh, that tells you. And all I was doing was vaping. But I always had a sore throat. I always, you know, coughed a lot. And um, I guess what I, I had a flavor that I liked. I, my nicotine level, I was trying to quit altogether. So I think the last nicotine level in the juice I used was a four or a six, which yeah. in the industry is very low. And right. I never went to the jewel because um, I understood, I was told that the tobacco juice or the nicotine juice was, you don't quit with that. It right. makes you go up. I'm sorry, I don't want to take too much time. The question I have is this for your information is uh, vaping isn't a tobacco product. And when you're talking about tobacco products like those cigars, um, you know, and and that sort of thing, um, I, I wonder what's going to happen when, and answer me, if, tell me if I'm wrong, when you try to, t- not you personally, but when they try to take new ports and cools off the shelves, there's going to be riots, you know, I, uh, for adults. And um, so I'm wondering, I, I, I think that the nicotine, which definitely is in the juice, or you can get it without nicotine, um, is a different product and I than the swishers and the cigarettes. And I, you know, I'd like you to address that and how they're going to separate those two. Yeah. So, so Meryl, first of all, the, this is an industry ruse where they attempt to deviate or differentiate, I should say, combustible tobacco from e-cigarettes. That's tobacco, but these are e-cigarettes. Now okay. they're still, they're still nicotine products. They still contain the ingredient that that not only you know creates a habit that is really hard to break, as you know. Oh, and I still you, want it. I still well, and you and you sound yeah, and you sound a lot like my dad. My so my dad had my dad had his heart. It's, he tried to quit so many times. He started smoking, you know, at eighteen, if not sooner. Uh, he's a, he was a World War II veteran, and they put cigarettes in his in his K rations, right? Sure. They, they encourage him to smoke, right? My dad could never quit. Could never quit. He has this heart attack at sixty. I wasn't there, but I heard that he was. You know, he, he never lost consciousness. He knew something was wrong. He was sitting. He was at my aunt's and uncle, uh, and he was sitting in a recliner, and he knew something was wrong. And he, the story I heard is he went into his pocket, he pulled out his pack of cigarettes, and he threw them across the room, and he never smoked again. My dad. Uh, he, he had he had bypass surgery. He lived to be eighty nine. So you know he uh, you know in the end you know he lived a good long life. But I think in part because he finally quit. But um, but the, so it's so you it really have to focus on the nicotine, and that's what that's what the industry tries to you know preach that this is a way for folks to get off of combustible tobacco, which isn't good for you, even though we're selling the products, and you know this is an alternative. But. Uh, and, and this is what we're going to hear tomorrow in Tempe. Don't take these products off the market because this is how adults are using. This is what they're using to get off the t- cigarettes. But for, you know, I, I don't have any numbers on this off the top of my head, but I'll just tell you off the top of my head for every adult that might use an e-cigarette to get off of tobacco, you know, a hundred kids are using e-cigarettes and a good percentage of them are eventually graduating to tobacco. So you can't put a, a bad, you can't keep a bad product on the market because it quote unquote helps some people when the vast majority of folks who use it, 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 it doesn't help them at all. And, and the statistics show that most kids who, who, who pick up the, you know, the habit of smoking cigarettes and cigars, you know, they initially started out now by using e-cigarettes. Oh, okay. Now, um, look, 
the, the, the menthol issue, no doubt about it, is controversial. Um, there's, there's been, you know, over the years, questions about, well, if, if, if 85% of it, and it's true, 85% of African-Americans who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes, and you're targeting, if you're going to target menthol products, then you're targeting the African-American community. Um, well, I would say if anybody's targeting the African-American community, it's the, it's the cigarette industry. That's why the number is at 85%. Now, you know, the Congressional Black Caucus, 35 members of the Congressional Black Caucus have signed a letter in support of the FDA's actions. They recognize now, and, and it took a while, you know, for folks to kind of come around, but they recognize, no, it's the other way around. Communities of color are being targeted by the industry, uh, and we need to do something about it. So, look, I think the menthol fight is going to continue for a while, but it's inevitable. The industry, by the way, knows that. That's why they introduced e-cigarettes to begin with. They know cigarettes and combustible tobacco is, is, is a dying habit that, I mean, literally dying, that, that fewer and fewer people are using it. So we need to find other ways to sustain our corporate profits. Hey, how about e-cigarettes? Okay. Hey, Joseph, Thank you. can you speak a little bit to how the e-cigarettes and vape pens and so on are used for substances other than tobacco? I mean, Lauren, I, honestly, I'm not that familiar with it, but look, these, these products can be opened up. They, they, you can refill them with other, you know, with cannabis, with, um, you know, illi other illicit drugs that are certainly much more dangerous. Um, these are instruments. They, this is a piece of equipment and it can right. be ad adapted and used in other ways. Now the, the disposable products, it's a little harder to do now. But those, you know, those initial, those early uh, e-cigarettes, you know, again, it was like this looked like a block with a, you know, with a tube coming out of it. Um, again, as Merrill mentioned, the juice. I mean, these, basically you'd buy your, you'd buy this, e it was called an e-cigarette, but it didn't even look like an e-cigarette. It looked like, again, it was like a little box, but you'd buy it, it, it and it would be, you know, but it, you would refill it with your products and with the juice. So you'd go in and get different juices. And this is how the flavors all came about because, Folks were mixing their own juices. They were mixing the banana and the strawberry, you know. And so, but that's how that happens. That 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 whether it's uh, cannabis products or something even worse, um, these product these these e-cigarette products, the the, the equip the piece of equipment itself can certainly be used for that purpose. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, if I can ask. Uh, permission to share the screen one more time. And I, this is not going to, um, I don't think this is going to be too visible, but I think it'll, so is, are you seeing that? Is that? Do you see that little, that flyer? Yes. Okay. So we did a study with a uh, with uh, one of our partners, and we did a well it was a tobacco retail study in Phoenix. We looked across the city and discovered and this is this is a this is about a year and a half ago, so it's probably you know a few more now. We we identified a thousand sixty seven tobacco retailers um, in across the city. Um, we only have sixty five McDonald's, but we got over a thousand tobacco retailers. Starbucks. I mean, if I have an addiction, it's Starbucks. I know every Starbucks in the state. Um, one, because I, I don't drink coffee, I drink tea. But also, they always have internet. And now, tonight's a good example. I need, a, I need a Starbucks just to get on the internet, right? But wherever I travel in the state, I set up a little office, you know, and I can do my emails and everything. So I know where every Starbucks is in the state. I, I probably know where all 129 are in Phoenix. But again, we have 10 times the number of tobacco retailers than we have um, um, uh, Starbucks, uh, which means that among other uh, considerations, 41% of our schools in Phoenix have a tobacco retailer within a thousand feet of its door, 41%. Now, when you, when you put a little, this is where it's going to be hard to read. And I can send this to any of you if you're interested, but when you do a little pin map, you know, where you, where you cite where the, where the tobacco retail shops are, Look how many more there are in South and West Phoenix compared to the rest of the city. You know, it's outrageous. 
It's absolutely outrageous. And this again demonstrates, you know, how the how the community or how the industry really zeroes in on certain communities. Any other questions? Come on, you're letting me off easy. Okay. Not a question, but more or less a comment. Yeah. About 30 years ago, uh, that uh some bright person somewhere did a study where he compared how successful a city was growing or becoming more prominent or uh, growing large by how many McDonald's they had in their city. And I think using that same type of reason, but I, I would be interested or want to know if there's any way we can find out, uh, compare that to the location of the stores and then the the, if possible, married with the use of that population using tobacco. Yeah. So in other words, because the, it seems like to me, the more stores there are, the greater chance or likelihood a person has no question. to smoke because it's no all question. around and stuff. So I want to. No, no, no question, Clyde. You're right. I'm not a study person or anything, yeah. but that might be a good study we could suggest to someone to find out. Yeah, but I mean, think think about to your point. Think about this: if if you have a, a vape shop, and there's another one across the street, you know, in order for both of you to survive, there has to be a strong demand in that community. Yeah, there has on. to be. You know, you can't. You could take two communities and have a thousand people in it. Maybe it'll support one e one um, tobacco retailer, and then there's another community, same number of people, thousand people that has two. Why does it have? To, why can two survive there? And only one can survive somewhere else. Here again, another example of the outrageous. Um, I think it's a matter of social justice when it comes to the legislature. The le one of the provisions in that bill that I talked about, 2050, HB 2050. Again, they're showing, the industry showing, well, we want to be good about it. We want to do the right thing. So they said, okay, we, we will agree in the bill. We'll, we'll craft in the bill that a tobacco, any future tobacco retail shops have to be 2,000 feet away from every school. Um, okay, what about the existing stores? Oh, no, they're grandfathered. So what they're saying is, when we build more homes in the desert in North Phoenix, those new rules will apply. But in the more densely populated central city where I live, and where we're and and for those of you who live, you know, again, let's just say, you know, south of Bethany Home, um, the 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 current concentration is acceptable. It's okay. Why is it why is it wrong there? But but it's okay here. That's what's just so outrageous again about an industry that writes these bills. They're they're not writing them because they're good corporate citizens. They're writing them because they know it's going to be in their interest. Next question. I have a question. Let me see. Sure, Ashley. Okay, so uh, for my job, I facilitate classes on drug abuse prevention. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious, in, in your opinion, or maybe through your research, if you have any insight on how these school-age teens are getting these devices. Yeah. Well, first of all, they're getting them from less than reputable retailers who don't care. They're getting them from Big Brother and Big Sister. Um, they, um, um, you know, there's clearly, you know, there's a black market for it, you know, and when I say it, it's not, nothing really sinister, you know, folks are able to get their hands on some of these products wholesale and are selling them out of their house. So when I say black market, it's basically, you know, outside the mainstream retail shops. One of the, um, one of the things that will be in the, uh, Tempe ordinance and in every ordinance that we will try to pass in other cities and towns hard to believe but Arizona is one of the one of several states I think there's about seven that does not have a tobacco retail license requirement anybody can sell tobacco anybody you can sell it out of your house so when I say it's black market they're not breaking any laws because anybody can sell tobacco in Arizona you don't need a license to sell it you need a license to sell alcohol but you don't need a license to sell tobacco. You need a license to open up a pharmacy. Frankly, any business has a business license, but you don't need 
a retail license to sell tobacco products. So what we are seeking is the enact in these ordinances a requirement that there be a that every tobacco retailer have a license. Now that really serves two purposes. One is we won't have to go out street by street and count how many retail shops there are to find out there's 1,067 in Phoenix. We will know because we will know how many folks, how many uh, shops have a retail license. It'll help us do the kind of research that you're talking about. Where, where are kids getting this stuff? Where are they buying it? But the real purpose of that is enforcement. Again, right now, if it was up to the industry, they want to crack down on the kids for buying these products. No, we want to crack down on the retailers. And if a retailer then is to violate the ordinance, sell a flavored product, sell it to somebody under the age of 21, which is against federal law, but the, but but there's really no penalty for it right now. Well, with a retail license, the penalty would be, we're going to yank your license and you're going to lose the right to sell these products. So that that's one way we're going to try to get the kind of data actually that you asked for. How are they getting it? Because we're going to, for the first time, know how many retailers there actually are. We'll be able to monitor their sales. You know, their sales tax uh, uh, records will, will reveal that, for example. But kids are getting these products. There's no question about it. And, um, and, and by the time they become hooked on nicotine, they really have no choice. They have to continually find, you know, some way to get these products. Joseph, how easy is it to get uh, one of these uh, um, e-cigarette mechanisms online without proper identification? Yeah, the, you know, these, these companies are uh, under federal law. Um, prohibited from, they, they violate the, ma the mail uh, statutes when they sell these products to those underage. Uh, but of course, that's hard to regulate. And uh, um, uh, there are there sh some of the shipping companies like uh, FedEx and UPS now no longer ship um, e-cigarette products. Oh, okay. so, 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 there are, so there are some, there are some shipping companies that still do that, but an increasing number don't. Okay. So that's good. That's going to be one way to sort of prevent that from happening. The market itself is going to, you know, at some point, these companies would be held accountable if it gets, it gets in the wrong hands, you know, kids underage. Mm -hmm. So they know that. So they're starting to basically get out of that market. Any other questions? Any of the slides that you'd like me to go back to for any reason that caught your attention? Laura, I'm going to send you a, a, a deck. So anybody who liked that, and of, course, and of course, you know, you all, you all are all, many of you are also part of other groups and organizations. Uh, you know, invite me. I'd be happy to address, deliver this or some variation of this presentation. But, uh, but if you can, uh, uh, Lauren received a notice from me today about the hearing in Tempe um, tomorrow. Um, uh, if any of you happen to live in Tempe or know people in Tempe, let Lauren know. Uh, he'll send you that notice that I sent to him. There's ways. This is a virtual meeting tomorrow, so it's not in person. You can uh, just uh, fill out a uh, support card online and just basically encourage the Tempe Council to enact the flavors ordinance. Uh, I've, I'm getting text. I mean, this is what our folks are doing tonight. I'm getting text while I'm sitting here and they're telling me that uh, we got about 150 of those support cards filed as of tonight. So, and I'm sure that number is going to grow even more. So we're, we're, it's all hands on deck tonight for us uh, because of Tempe. I, have, uh, I do have a question this time. Sure, uh, and this may be because we do have someone that joined us from another part of uh, from the app from, from the Philippines. And I yeah. was wondering, do you have any stats or anything or to compare the situation here in Arizona with either one around the rest of the country or or, or around the rest of the world? Yeah. Uh, and the reason why I ask this is because uh, we do know that in other countries, Young people start smoking as young as two or three years old. I've seen uh, things up there, and that's why we have World No Tobacco Day. So I want to know if how this vaping 
things is affecting other countries and if you have any information on I don't have that. I don't have that number readily available. But again, on slides two and three, we had some uh, national statistics, and then where did Arizona stack up uh, nationally? I don't have uh, information on uh, you know how we compare to other countries, but uh, nationally, high schools, high school uh, males who currently, uh, first of all, high school students who currently uh, smoke, it's about four point six percent. Uh, boys about 5.4 percent, girls 3.9 percent. But basically, you know, we're talking about almost five percent uh, of uh, high school students nationally uh, who indicate that they smoke. Uh, in Arizona, it's 5.3 percent. So we're a little bit higher than than again that national average, which is 4.6 percent. Uh, among 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 high school males who currently uh, are cigar smokers, again nationally, that's five point four percent. In Arizona, it's seven point one percent. So significant, okay. significantly higher in Arizona than the national average. Uh, high school students who currently uh, use e-cigarettes, it's eleven point three percent. In Arizona, it's seventeen point nine percent. Uh, adults who smoke nationally uh, is 14, 14, 14 even, slightly higher among men uh, than women. Uh, in, so again, remember that number, it's 14% in Arizona. The number of adults who smoke is 13%, so it's slightly lower. So we have a significantly greater percentage of youth who smoke and use e-cigarettes and a slightly lower adult population. Um, and again, I would say this, you might say this is something to celebrate because, uh, you know, we're, we're winning a war maybe, you might say, when it comes to adult smoking. Well, maybe so, but it's coming at the expense of our kids because what they're doing is they're targeting kids. They're targeting kids with advertising and sponsorships and again, these flavors in particular. Joe, um, we did get... Uh uh, uh, a, a chat message from uh, Preciosa Jean. Uh, she said, sorry, sir, uh, but she does not have a mic, but vape is surely popular in the Philippines. Wow, and, wow. Then, and then she follows with saying, teenagers nowadays can buy vapes through online. Yeah. All right. So and, again, the, and our, our law... And, 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 and I asked her if they see a high percentage of youth using. I posed that question to her. Yeah. The, the, uh, I get, Lauren, I'm going to try to get an answer to you uh, because t Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids is, is international now. It is functioning in other countries. And uh, I'm going to have to uh, see if they've got – I've never been asked that question. I love getting asked a question I have never heard before because now it makes me do some research. But I'm going to see, Clyde, if I can get some data on okay. where do we stack up against other countries. Okay. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right. Any other questions or feedback for Mr. Yuhas? Hey, um, I apologize to everybody for calling in late, but um, Joseph, Joe, did you show a video earlier? No, I, have, I showed a PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but but I'm gonna, the great thing about that is uh, well, actually, this is on video, so Lauren can send out the recording. Uh, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna also send him the PowerPoint so he can distribute it to all of you. And the PowerPoint has got a lot of times. PowerPoints just have little bullets, you know. I I know that this is the kind of thing I like to share with people, so I try to put a little bit more detail into the PowerPoint itself. So. I think you'll see other, uh, you know, you'll see some data here that I think will be interesting. Well, very good. Do we have any other questions or input? Well, Mr. Yuhas, Joseph, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing Hi, with Laura. us. Well, thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Thank you all. We we know that you've been working feverishly at this at, at the Phoenix level for quite some time, but it's good to see that you are uh, shifting gear. Well, not shifting gears, but figuring out 
where you can adjust in order to make this work. So, you know, Lord, sadly, there's, you know, there's, there's so few profiles of courage these days in the halls of government. And, you know, it's going to be a lot easier to find some folks who will be the second folks through the door. Um, the first is, is a little more of a challenge, but I think we're on the verge of making that happen in Tempe. And if that happens, I, I, I can tell you that we're, we're in conversations now with folks in Goodyear, Buckeye, Tolleson, Avondale, Flagstaff. Um, I'd be, if we're successful in Tempe, I'd be very surprised that we don't have five to eight cities having either adopted the ordinance or, uh, you know, it's in the process of being adopted by the end of the year. Um, you know, when we, when we passed, if you recall, before the smoking ban was passed, statewide smoking ban was on the ballot in 2006. Prior to that, cities were doing this. They're doing exactly what we're doing now. They banned smoking in restaurants and public places town by town until the point came where, and Phoenix was not one of the early cities to do it. Ironically enough, Tempe was, was one of the earliest. So here we are back in Tempe again, 15 years later. Right. Um, but I, 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 uh, I think that's what's going to have to happen here. We're just going to do it town by town. The difference now, though, is, and this is why, you know, even, even compared to the smoking ban. Okay, so we banned smoking in one town versus another. But the difference here is these companies selling these products, you know, they have to load up their truck every night. And that truck's got to make the rounds. And if we're making screwing things up for them, where that truck, well, they could do, drop drop it off at this store in this town, but they can't do it in that town, that's really going to foul them up. So that's sure. sort of the one of the strategies here that if we if we do this town by town kind of approach, it's going to make it so frustrating for the industry that at some point, even if we don't have the ban in every city, they're just going to throw up their hands and they say Arizona is not a place for us to do business anymore. All right. All right. Uh, one last comment. Um, uh, well, two. One is from uh, Preciosa Jean. She says, definitely, sir, sadly, three of uh, her yeah. minor cousins yeah. use vaping and they're influenced by their friends. Yeah, and the question is, are, yeah, I wonder if they, I wonder if they, uh, if they were related, you know, their cousins, obviously, but they lived in the same, they all the same family, you know, right, that happens right. a lot. you know, if one, one vapes, the other, you know, the other one does. And, you know, and, right. and, you know, you know, one other, one other point Mer to, to Meryl's question early on about, and she might be, you, Meryl, you might be the exception to this, but, but the studies show that, that most adults, you know, who claim that this is a way for them to wean themselves off of tobacco are vaping, but they still continue to use tobacco as well. You know, maybe not as much, but they're still using it. Um, and so, it look, you know, w w I tell, you know, among the crazy flavors these products come in, vape products, are s breakfast cereals. Breakfast cereals. You know, Cocoa Puffs, Captain Crunch, uh, you know, Fruit Loops, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's face it. Nobody goes from being the Marlboro Man to Captain Crunch. You just don't do that. You just don't do that. It's, it's yeah. rare. You're right. I, out of several of my friends um, who uh, went to vape, I've seen most of them go to cigarettes. Yeah. I, you know, back. I was successful, um, but I, like I told you, I, sa I sat here. Um, I teach online college classes, and I sat here grading papers with the thing in my mouth. Or when I went driving around, it was there to, yeah. this, to this day in my car. I made that motion of looking, where's my vape pen? Yeah. But it's not there. Right. So um, nothing cures this. No, it becomes a, yeah, disease. exactly. Yeah. Cigarettes, nothing improves it. My father quit cold turkey on the day after his heart attack. But unlike your father, he lived to 62. Oh, so that's sad. Yeah. it's very sad. And he was, you know, greatest generation where they yep. gave up Chesterfields, lucky strikes, mm -hmm. you know, but they didn't have the information. I know. Now. But 62, my yeah. God. It, uh, I know. I know. Well, God bless you, Meryl. Well, thank you. You were lucky. Okay. Mm.
Lauren, so, thanks again. Thanks again, Lauren. You know, I'm a phone call away for you guys. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. Yeah. And uh, we uh, appreciate you taking time to share this information with us and uh, doing what you can to what we at HEAL call and, and other uh, agencies that are working on this, doing the environmental change that, that is necessary to uh, give our young people a safer environment to live in. Great. Thank you, Joe, thank you. My, my, my second favorite, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Still tells you that. Thank you very much. All right, then. All right. Thank, thank you all. You thank you all. See you and soon. I'm, 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 just an update on my on my uh, my uh, Wi-Fi. I still see it's still out. So who knows what's going oh, on here? Oh wow! Well, yeah. I'm glad you have the resources to switch yeah. gears and thank you. Uh, get back thank on you. with us. Thanks very you much. Very well. Very soon. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. Bye, Bye, -bye. everybody.